Well, that was the week for August the 19th, 2022, Keith. It's a hot month, August. Supposedly, it's only mad dogs and Englishmen that go out. But there have been some other VCs out in the hot sun of August, and they seem kind of crazy too, right? Well, you know, dogs can be mad, but so can people. And the question this week is, is Mark Andreessen mad? Or is... He looks mad in that photo. I don't know if he actually is. Looks like his head's been particularly elongated. Maybe, maybe that's just. No, that is how he looks. Actually, I think he's. The rumor is that he's done it on purpose. Of course, the second question is: Is Adam? It's called. They, they pronounce it Newman, but I'm pretty convinced it should be pronounced Neumann. What do you think? On the. On the pronunciation or on whether they're yeah, mad? Pronunciation. So, you know, is he bad in the Michael Jackson sense or is he bad in the traditional sense? Well, let's let's remind the audience of the story. Here, this guy, Neumann or Newman or however you pronounce it, was the guy who lost, what, $20 billion at WeWorks and flirted with, I think uh, various kinds of investigation, including perhaps even criminal investigation. You'd think he would have slunk off, but he hasn't. And Mark Andreessen, perhaps the most credible or certainly the most powerful investor in the world, certainly in Silicon Valley, is now putting more money into Newman. So this does seem very odd. Well, my editorial is all about why it isn't odd. Um, and I don't go into the accusations about him historically. I, as far as I know, he hasn't been charged with any criminal offense. I do think he self-served, you know, he sold shares. He has a terrible reputation. I mean, I, I've done some interviews with, um, with a couple of journalists who wrote books about him. I mean, he seems to capture all the worst excesses and dishonesty and hype and egoism of founders. I, I think of those things as attributes of a founder um, in other words you almost can't trust somebody with as big an amount as 350 million unless they combine um, an edge craziness almost uh, with the ability to be linear and operate and have vision because if you gave that amount of money to a normal person they wouldn't know what to do with it so Big wins in venture. I mean, if, I've, I don't know if you've ever met Jeff Bezos or Larry and Sergey or um, Elon Musk. They're not normal people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so it almost goes with the territory. If you want to make a big bet and this bet. No, I, I take that point. I mean, I've met Bezos. Um, you could say the same about um jobs as well though we never raised this kind of money uh, and certainly Kalalnik but that doesn't give you an excuse to always invest in people who've lost huge amounts of money and are deeply controversial where'd you draw the line I mean would you put more money into Kalalnik and what about Elizabeth well, Holmes when she gets out of jail well she's she's different she's why is she different well I think there's a line between lying and believing it's like religion okay it's a lie that there's a god but people who believe in god are not liars um so no, I, I i that's a very convenient line you're drawing i i don't see any difference i mean holmes was a very gifted storyteller and very gifted saleswoman too why why not put money into whatever she's doing next maybe she could be more honest in terms of theranos i mean it's an interesting idea i mean it seems like he's just, is he just repeating we work? What's the new idea? Well, I, I think the first thing is his old idea hasn't gone away. We, yeah, we and were, I mean, it's a real, it was a real business and remains a real business. It remains a real business. And it's probably at the low point of its value right now. And who's to say it won't go back up above where it was when, so he will not have lost all that money. So, so why, why did it work? Because he had the idea that office buildings meet, meet, meet uh, transient workforces is an opportunity to create temporary desks and facilities. And that probably is even more valid now than it ever was before. Well, certainly post-COVID, isn't it? And it does reflect the new sort of precariat style 
operations that most of us run. We don't work for companies, we work for ourselves, but we need more than just home offices. So I accept. Yeah. And then, so this new idea, we do, firstly, let's just say we don't really know what it is because they haven't fully disclosed it. But if, if, if you um, consider the situation with the residential real estate, he's talking about two things, really, rents and mortgages. Um, mortgages is the, one of the biggest markets for anything in the world. It's hundreds of trillions of dollars annually. And, you know, when, and, and that's because it owns properties. And these properties, when they uh, accumulate value, the, the interest you've paid on the mortgage is a massive chunk of the sale price of a house. So most of the residential real estate market is funding in mortgage givers. And rents, you know, we all know what we think about landlords. Uh, rent, rent is also not a very human way of, you know. Look, yeah, um, I mean, but you, yeah. you can make this broad argument. I mean, obviously, the real estate market is a, the, the real estate economy is one that's being disrupted and will be more disrupted and there's money to be made. But my question more about Andreessen in particular is, is he kind of tone deaf or does he enjoy sticking his finger in the media's eye and the rest of us eye? Because clearly this has all the makings of a PR disaster. To be He's reinvesting not. in a guy who already has essentially undermined his own reputation. Why, why not find someone younger? Less, I mean, you can find other crazy people. Why invest in New Newman? Yeah. So two separate questions. One about Andreessen, one about Newman. The Andreessen side... <clears throat> I, I do know him a little bit. He he is not, um, uh, you know, he's not afraid to put his reputation on the line when he believes in something. Uh, he has no love for the media. That's definitely true. Yeah. But he, would, but he wouldn't write a check for $350 million uh, to fight those fights. He, he's writing the check because he believes it will turn into a, at least, at least $35 billion over a, seven to ten year period so he's driven by the same currency that all venture capitalists are driven by um i was on the gilmore gang this morning and i made the point that the product of venture capitalists is money they put a small amount in and want to get a big amount out and they don't really have opinions about what the money is you know how it's put to work they may have some ethical constraints but they just want to turn money into more money so he believes that this will, this will happen. Now that takes us to um, Newman. Newman, uh, no matter what else he is, he's a proven big hitter who isn't intimidated by taking on large societal structures and trying to change them. So if he is going after mortgages and rents and trying to transform that, which would be the biggest version of, of an idea, he might not be, by the way. He might be going after something much smaller, which is roughly real uh, residential real estate as a service, where the landlord is expected to give you things, not just take money from you. And you know, the Airbnb version of of renting or buying a home, where where there's a service provider who you like because they do good things, that would be the smallest version of the idea. Either one of them is big. And, and I think Andreessen is simply saying, look, I don't really ca care what this guy did before because I don't think he's a criminal. I just think he uh, was a little bit too aggressive with his growth curve and therefore got beyond himself. A little bit too aggressive, yeah. I mean, now you sound like his PR spokesman. I, I don't Well, you asked me I... what Andreessen's thinking. I'm just telling you what I think he's thinking. I'm not saying I agree with that. Although... Um... I, mean, I, I, I mean, you present VCs as a ideological phalanx. I don't think they are. I, I can't see some of the VCs I know. I mean, I interviewed Brad Feld on my show a week or two ago. I can't imagine. I'm kidding, it's a different kind of investor and he doesn't have $350 million to invest. But I can't imagine a guy like that or even someone like Fred Wilson or certainly Albert Wenger or John Borthwick. None of these people would invest in someone like Newman. Well, I think depends on your on your spectrum. You know, you could have your spectrum as making a small amount of money versus making a large amount of money, or it could be um, investing in things that uh, you believe in ethically, 
and morally versus just making money. I think Andreessen is on the just making money end of that spectrum, uh, but he does focus in on things to disrupt. Um, and, and there's no question that residential real estate is a, you know, it's a 16th century model that's still pretty futile. Um, and so there is the opportunity to reinvent it if you've got enough money to go after it. Uh, and and that, if you can do that, you combine good things, goodness, moral goodness, with huge amounts of money. And that's kind of the sweet spot. Brad is one of the more touchy-feely, caring investors when it comes to the earth or people. And mm. so he's going to be a lot more constrained in what he can put money into than Andreessen is. Yeah, I well, it will be. It's 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 too easy to be speculative because we don't know what the business is. Uh, another VC who comes up in the newsletter this week is Reed Hoffman. There's some interesting stuff to say about AI. I I would be surprised if Hoffman would invest in someone like Newman. I think Hoffman knows where to draw the line. Yeah, I think uh, to be honest, Reed has got two brains at the moment. One is in politics and the other is in tech. And he's doing a lot of uh, work for the forthcoming midterm elections. And he's very dedicated to making sure Trump never gets back into power. What What's uh, Hoffman got to say about um, AI? Um, he's talking about um, a couple of things. One is uh, uh, DALI and particularly on images. And the second is about NFTs. So, and they, he combines them. Um, he's clearly in awe of Dali's ability to produce images from inputs um, and to make unique, you know, very good, unique visual things from, from the inputs that you give it. Um, there's, there's another thing I read today about. Um, some Byzantine poetry that has never previously been translated, and they gave it to GPT-3, uh, the fragments that they had with the unfinished ones, and it was able to complete the poems, even though the poems were in an ancient, I think it was a Greek script. Um, so, you know, the, Dali is kind of interesting. And what Reed talks about is, um, and it's a LinkedIn piece, here it is, he talks about um, uniqueness, uh, meaning scarcity, uh, meets uh, abundance. So scarcity is like the idea of what he calls limited edition, but abundance is you can do it on as many different things as you want. And so um, you get to monetize abundance by creating scarcity in the context of abundance. So it's kind of an interesting, and you can tell what's happening here is he's thinking aloud about the impact of NFTs and AI on, on the world of art, basically, but not just art. Um, and he goes through what he did. It's like a kid with a toy, actually. It's nice to read because you can see his engagement with the code and, the, and his surprise at what comes back and, um, his enchantment with it really as well. It's quite a, quite a long piece and he gives lots of examples. And Web3 so, uh, slips back in. Uh, I thought that was a dead phrase. But Brian Solis, who we haven't talked about, I don't think, in this show, and someone I've known for a while, you've known him. He believes that Web3 is going to rewrite the concept of marketing. How and why? Yeah, so Brian, uh, Brian is, is uh, firstly... Brian's his own person. He's a guy with an opinion. Uh, he's been um, using technology like the one we're using today for years. Um, by the way, he has great high-end cameras and great lighting, so his stuff is always always looks really good. He's now at Salesforce, where his job is understanding the future of marketing. Like Steve Gilmore, then Salesforce seems to give everyone a will they give us a job, Keith? Uh, I don't think anyone. They won't give me one. They might give you one. I doubt it. Um, anyway, so what, what he talks about is how traditional marketing, um, where you know your customers and you kind of do one-to-one -one marketing with tracking and so on and so forth, uh, is going away. That what, what Web3 
Bree is going to do is completely change the relationship between organizations and customers, where customers become stakeholders, not just targets. Uh, and this, this one before. You know, it's it's ironic, maybe more than ironic, that someone like Solis is saying this and he's gone to work for a traditional company. Well, he's helping transform their understanding. And, you know, if Salesforce is taking Web3 and blockchain seriously, then that implies everyone should be because they know what they're doing. And, um, you know, I, I, want, you, I just think that Solis is one of the more astute what exactly is he doing at Salesforce? He's is helping he consulting, or is he has a full time job? I actually don't. I think he has a full time job. That I think he announced it about a year or so ago, uh, but that's my remembrance. So I, I could be wrong about that. But I think he has a full time job, and this was him doing a tour in Australia to talk about some of this stuff to Salesforce audiences. So I, I think it's a full time job, and you know. Fair dues to him. He is, they often say, don't ever put an expert from the previous generation in a job when everything's changing because they'll bring all their previous generation biases to the new one and then they'll kill what's new by trying to make so, it. So could Dali, uh, Reed Hoffman's Dali, could they make many Brian Solaces? They, they, they could make many pictures of Brian Solaces, maybe even videos. Um, but they couldn't make another Brian Solis. There's only ever going to be one of those. There's only ever going to be one Keith Tier. Anything else happening this week in a quiet week in August? Uh, the 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 GPT three for science was interesting. Um, that's in the essays of the week. Uh, we don't need to let belabor this one, but this is somebody who understands both science and what's going on in AI, and makes the point that AI is only as good as the data available to it. And in science, there's a, l a limit in what, what data you can get. So he writes a very long essay about how you could be, begin to think about um, AI and science. In, in some ways, the, the last week's um, show where we talked about um, <clears throat> the, the Google uh, company that did uh, world beating Go and has now figured out every protein in the human body. Mm. What's the name? That again, uh, dark or deep, deep mind, deep mind, deep mind. So in a way, this kind of links to that deep mind story. It's another. Well, it's AI isn't going to help Manchester United, is it? Although I heard that Elon Musk was buying them. Isn't that why didn't you put that in the newsletter? It's interesting. All my kids sent me that tweet, very excited, hoping it was true. And then very next tweet afterwards was Musk saying it was a joke. Well, Manchester uh -huh. United's a joke. I, I would have thought you'd have been behind that, Keith. You know, the problem at Manchester United is not ownership, although it could certainly be better, but that's not the problem. The problem is who's been hired into the football side of the club, not the coach. The coaches have been quite good. It's the recruiting and the management of the football side. Who is the equivalent um, of Adam Newman in football terms? Would it be Ronaldo? I think it would be Eric Cantona or... Who, uh, who's the Italian guy that um, scored a goal this week that gets kicked out of every club? Uh, Afri African Italian guy. Um, yeah, he played for Manchester City. Yeah, him. He'd be he'd be Adam Newman because he can do big things and he can imagine doing big things and sometimes he actually does the big things that he imagines. Well, speaking of talent, we couldn't have a that was the week without something about Substack, which is in the business of aggregating and helping talent monetize itself. What's the Substack news this week, Keith? So Substack is, is really on a roll. Um, the first thing I started with is uh, this guy who built a Substack and sold it for five figures. I think five figures is, you know, $10,000 or more, right? Gotta be. I wonder if he tells us how much he sold it for. I didn't actually pick up on the price. Well, that means he sold it for ten thousand. Because if he sold it for more, he would tell us. Exactly. Um, uh, he got he got five thousand a month in recurring revenue uh, for ten dollars a month that people pay. And by the way, anyone listening to this, you can you can pay me nine dollars a month if you want to. Um, anyway, uh, I thought that was interesting. I think that's the first newsletter that's been sold. Um, 
I, and what well, about so Substack real meat was the, Threads? What does that mean? So Substack Threads. So up until today, um, uh, or until this announcement, the only way to do a comment on a Substack is to comment on a specific item that's published within a, within somebody's newsletter. Yeah. So can, um, well, what they've done now is they're creating a, a discussion area for the author across all of their writing. So now you can get to know the author and interact with them through comments. And they're very civilized comments, uh, so far at least. Um, uh, and so in a way, they're trying to focus on building, allowing a writer to build a community around themselves. Uh, I think the next step is going to, to, to start to, uh, they haven't said this, but I believe they'll add at mentions. So for example, I could comment on your stuff and you could at mention me in response, and anyone following me would see your at mention, even though they don't go to but your. You really public... think that Substack is su sort of successfully building itself, weaving itself into the the network infrastructure? They're doing it as well as anyone. I think they are, and they've just upgraded their statistics. I've noticed on mine, they now track where people come from and what they do, and who's driving subscribers. They've got a thing called recommendations. So, for example, if you had a Substack, I could recommend it. Uh, what that means is anyone looking at mine will see recommendations at the bottom. And they show you how many subscribers are driven by how many recommendations. Yeah. So, I, for example, I know that 13 subscribers to Gilmore Gang have come because I recommended Gilmore Gang uh, on Substack. Um, so it, they're beginning to build an economy where you can help each other. Maybe, maybe not. Certainly, um, you put Substack Week before News of the Week, but it's the News of the Week is where all the action is. Uh, Apple tells its staff to come back to work. Uh, global private equity deals fall by 63% in July. Uh, uh, public stock held by Sequoia, Andreessen, and Bessemer fall 44%. So... You 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 put all the bad news at the end. You're hiding it, Keith. You know, you told me some time ago that you hate this good news bad news thing. So now I just call it essays of the week. That's the good news, and news of the week, which is not always news of the week, is the truth. It's what really happens, and everyone's losing their money, and everyone's going having to go back to work. No one wants to. That's the reality, isn't it? But what about what about this one, Andrew? U.S. streaming tops cable TV viewing for the first. Oh, I told week. you about that. Yeah, that's a good one. That's uh, good yeah. news. So what do you think is going on? I mean, it's not surprising, I guess, to you and me, but is there a story behind this that anyone cares about? I think the story to me is never write Netflix off. Never write Amazon off. Never write Netflix off. So that sounds about right. Uh, and then Apple, Apple's probably making a huge blunder, right? I mean... But they can tell staff to come into the office. I hear some of the other big firms have said that, Google, for example, but no one comes in. What are they going to do? Fire them all? Force them to come in? Come around to their homes and you would imagine drag them into the office? There's not much they can do. I, I, you know, it's interesting. What it made me think is there's a league table of submission. Like, which companies' employees are the most submissive to their employer? And my guess is Apple's are amongst the most submissive because they buy into what yeah, Apple's terrified. Done. Yeah. Well, don't don't mention league tables, Keith. At least from a Manchester United point, because <laughs> we can have some fun with that. What yeah. about a startup of the week? I hope it's not Apple. Guess what? There's three. Three. Wow. Number one is a company called Optic, which just raised eleven million dollars as a seed round. And they claim that they have software that can tell the difference between a fake or a real NFT. Oh, I bet I bet Reed Hoffman's invested in that one. They do they do make the point that on Open Ocean, which is the biggest NFT marketplace, close to ninety percent are fraudulent. Um, so this obviously is very needed. But that Second, also shows how absurd the whole thing is, because it's all built on trust, and and then you're suggesting most of it isn't real yeah that people are stealing and reminting so if you do an nft it's always been possible for me to steal the image uh, but i can't steal your nft but if i steal your image and create my own nft 
um, now there's two v NFTs with your image and figure out which is the valid NFT, which is the source and which is a copy that therefore is a challenge. So that's why you I'll believe. I, I mean, it's like crypto. I, the more I hear about this stuff, the more absurd, potentially fraudulent and empty it all is. I don't believe in the NFT market just as I don't believe in crypto. Do you believe in NFTs? Oh, strongly. I think NFTs. I are think it be... reflects the general poverty of the tech sector at the moment that we're wasting our time talking about NFTs. What are your other startups? Um, the second one is uh, a VC fund called Stride, which is run by a Belgian called Fred Destan, who's got a long history in venture capital. Um, I, he's a friend of mine. Uh, full disclosure, he works out of London, and he's just raised his biggest. A solo fund of 200 million and uh, I just wanted to testimonialize his success because he's a great guy but the more interesting one is this one ethereum name creation doubles in four months to two million names we talked last week about these you know naming services that are not part of the normal internet well one of them is called ethereum names which means that you can have a wallet with ethereum in called andrew Keen's wallet and you, uh, normal Ethereum wallets have like long strings of numbers and letters. Ethereum names make it possible to say, my wallet is Andrew Keen's wallet. And these guys sell names and, and they're getting really big and growing really, really fast. So I think- uh, You've this... always been in the name business, Keith. I mean, real names was your one of your big near hits or near misses. Um, it was. I mean, does that reflect though a real business in Ethereum or crypto, or is it just more froth, more? Well, more Ethereum, just, Ethereum just names is hype on hype. You know that old phrase about "Don't be a gold digger, sell picks and shovels to the gold diggers." These guys are the picks and shovels guys in Ethereum. Yeah, but they're selling picks and shovels to people where there isn't any gold. No, there is gold, and it's yeah. just froth on top of froth. Well. You know, it's hard to deny that there is froth on top of froth, but um, it's a little bit like a good cappuccino. There's real coffee underneath. But I have to say, having begun this conversation skeptical of Andreessen's investment in, in Newman, I actually, the more I think about it, the, the wiser he is, rather than wasting his money on NFTs or Ethereum naming services. And what about Tweet of the Week, Keith? Uh, I love this one. Matt Gray, who says, I've done nine million in revenue in three and a half years as a solopreneur, and I didn't write a single line of code. Here are my 13 must use no code apps. And a no code app is, bas is basically the ability to create apps without being a computer engineer due to this whole proliferation of services that now let you do that. I use one called. Um, um, Drona HQ. Uh, there's another one called Retool.io. Anyway, this guy lists the 13 best no-code tools. So if, if you have an idea and you want to build an app, go and read his tweet and look at the tools. And almost for sure, you'll find a mix of tools that would allow you to not have to hire an engineer and do it yourself. But wouldn't it be better still to hire an engineer? Why waste his time? I can't imagine any really top-rate entrepreneur like you, Keith, wasting your time with code. I bet you never do that. <laughs> I, I, It's interesting you should say this. And, <laughs> and, uh, remember, I was the chief technology officer at EasyNet. Um, and before that, I... I'm the chief technology officer at Now TV. I'm not sure what that says about Now TV or myself, though. Well, and before in my career... Warner Brothers Music hired me to write their a &R database, which I did, and Mobile Oil hired me to write a database called Passport to allow people to do skills on their oil platforms. So I haven't coded for the best part of 30 or 40 years, but the last month I have been coding at SignalRank, and I've built an entire predictive analytics engine sitting on top of our um, data about uh, seed round and A round funding and uh, the creation of unicorns. So I know more about unicorns and how they're produced than anyone on the planet now. I've become an expert. And is the rumor also true that Manchester United is going to um, sign you to lead their attack? 
Sadly not, but I do have, every now and then I have a dream where I play for Manchester United and it's, we always win when I'm in, when, in a dream. Uh, we know the show is coming to an end when Keith starts talking about his dreams. That was the week for August the 19th, an interesting week when Mark Andreessen embarrassed himself, not for the first or the last time, but maybe he's smarter than all of us. Keith, have a great week. I hope um, that you continue to code and continue to be the master of the universe when it comes to figuring out who is going to become a unicorn and who won't. We will see you all next week. Thank you. Bye, everyone.